Hello, hello, and welcome to California Death Row, where we're talking about it. There are currently 727 condemned inmates on California Death Row, and today we're going to talk about the death of two half-sisters. Deborah Samino and Diane Penson were two half-sisters that shared a Sacramento townhouse. They were killed in the early morning hours of Sunday, March 20th, 1983. Diane was found the next day in her bedroom, dead of, dead of stab wounds and strangulation. Debbie, also strangulated, was found in her car, which was parked outside the townhouse. The principal evidence against Duane consisted of his fingerprints inside the townhouse and Debbie's car. Pubic and other hairs found at the crime scene that were consistent with Duane's hairs and inconsistent with Debbie's and Diane's. Duane's initial false exculpatory statements to police, including an attempt to manufacture an alibi. Duane, Duane's eventual partial admission to presence at the crimes. At the time of their deaths in 1983, Diane was 32 and Debbie was 20. Both were single, even, and Diane had previously been married and she was divorced. They lived alone in the townhouse. Their mother, Lori Semino, and Deborah's father, which is Diane's stepfather, Michael Semino, lived about a block away. Jeanette Williams was a third sister who lived in Sacramento with her 10 year old daughter, Michelle and they visited Diane and Deborah frequently, including on the weekend of their deaths. Diane and Debbie were uh, security conscious. They locked their front door even when they, we were home and they set a burglar alarm at night. On Saturday, March 19th, Michelle, who had spent Friday night at Diane's and Deborah's townhouse, helped Deborah with her car. They cleaned her car thoroughly inside and out, they wiped the back window with Windex and the interior surfers, surfaces with Armor All. Diane took Michelle home around 3.30 p.m., then went to a movie with Michael. Diane dropped Michael off after the, after the film and spoke to him by telephone around 6 p.m., saying that instead of having dinner with him as planned, she would rather stay home and watch some videos. Sherilyn Hope was a friend of Deborah's and spent around two hours on Saturday, March 19th from 9 to 11 at the townhouse with Deborah, mostly in her bedroom. Deborah was wearing beige shorts and a red and white top, had just finished cleaning the bedroom before Sherilyn's visit. Around 11.30, Lori telephoned the townhouse and spoke with Deborah, who said she had polished her nails and cleaned the townhouse that evening that she, she was tired and she was going to bed and that Diane was already in bed. Lori could also hear Diane's voice in the background. That was the last time Lori talked to her two daughters. On Saturday, March 20th, Sherilyn and two other friends of Deborah's tried repeatedly to reach Deborah at home by telephone, but no one answered the phone. Deborah's body was discovered in, in her car, which was parked in in a carport next to the townhouse. And carport and driveway are kind of hand in hand. On the morning of Monday, March 21st, by a concerned friend of both sisters who learned Deborah had not shown up at work, could not be reached by telephone. The friend also noticed two newspapers, including a Sunday paper, on the front doorstep. Police were called and dispatched about 10 a.m. The first officer on the scene discovered Diane's body inside the townhouse and saw Deborah's in her car. Deborah's body lay on the back seat of her car, clothed only in a red and white top. Various other items, including a parka, a robe, and a blanket, covered her body. Deborah's purse and its contents were scattered on the front passenger floor. On the back floor, were a pair of jogging shoes, a pair of socks, jeans, and black panties. Near her feet was a plastic piece of the seat structure was cracked through. According to the autopsy pathologist, the cause of death was manual strangulation, 
This was shown in her alia by, Patiki, by Patikia on her eyelids and the whites of her eyes, external marks on her neck and internal hemorrhaging in her neck and tongue. Though no sperm was detected in the swabs taken from Deborah, there was a quarter inch tear in the skin at the opening of her vagina and adjacent bruising cons consistent with sexual assault and inconsistent with ordinary personal hygiene. Pathologists also found defensive wounds and a torn fingernail on Deborah's hands and a bruise on her forearm. Diane was laying on her back on her unmade bed. She was nude and her mother testified that she always slept in a nightgown or a long shirt. A bloodstained pillow, a torn pillowcase, and one part of a telephone without its cords lay on the bed as well. Under Diane's body were several identification cards belonging to Deborah. A pair of red panties were tucked between the mattress and the bed frame. Elsewhere in the room were found another piece of torn pillowcase, this one knotted, the remaining portion of the telephone, also with no cords, two knives, one with visible blood on it, a damp blood-stained dish cloth, and blood spots on the wall. The pathologist opined Diane had died of both stabbing and strangulation. Strangulation was with a ligature, which could have been a straight telephone cord. Ligature strangulation was shown by Patikia, her dark and puffy face, and the pattern of straight, narrow wounds on her neck. Apparent ligature marks were also on her wrist and ankles. Diane had been stabbed with a knife or a smaller weapon at least five times in the upper abdomen, including wounds to the heart and liver. Some of the wounds were apparently aggravated by the weapon having been partially withdrawn and thrusted back in a different angle in the same area. There was no physical evidence of sexual assault. The telephone in the townhouse kitchen was on the floor, missing its flat cord. In the bathroom, several wet towels were lying around the sink, a condition uncharacteristic of Deborah and Diane's housekeeping. Now, if you remember, they lock their doors even when they're home and they set a burglar alarm when they're going to bed. So a damped cloth or towel around the sink was uncharacteristic. Deborah's bedroom disclosed no sign of a struggle, though a knife was found under the pillow. The telephone was in working order, and two telephone cords were later found under the bottom sheet of Deborah's bed. One flat cord with a small amount of blood on it, and the other coiled with fibers matching those on the floorboard of Deborah's car. The front door to the townhouse was unlocked, and there was no signs of forced entry. Dwayne's latent fingerprints were found on the telephone body and receiver in Diane's bedroom, as well as on the door, door jam of that room. Dwayne's prints were also found at several places on the exterior of Debbie's car and on the interior backseat surface above her body, with the fingers of the print pointing towards her head, which was on the driver's side of the seat, along with latent prints belonging to others identified and unidentified. Three pubic hairs, one combed from Deborah's pubic hair and two found on a robe found in her car, showed characteristics consistent with the microscopic appearance and structure of Duane's, but inconsistent with Deborah's. Two scalp hairs, the criminalist described as Negro, were found on a blanket covering Deborah's body. Deborah was excluded as the donor of these hairs. Dwayne, who was African American, could not be excluded. When arrested on March 22, 1983, Dwayne had several scratches on his abdomen, which he said was incurred playing handball the previous day. On Monday, March 21, 1983, in the initial police investigation of the deaths, Debbie's friend and mother mentioned Dwayne as an acquaintance of Deborah's. Officers Hash and Dean contacted Duane that evening. Duane was cooperative, giving the officers a tape interview and supplying them with fingerprint samples. According to Duane's statements on March 21st, 
He knew Debbie from high school where they had been friends. They corresponded during a period he spent uh, during a period he spent away from Sacramento and on his return they renewed their friendship. Dwayne was not Deborah's lover, though he would have liked to have been. Dwayne had been in Diane and Deborah's townhouse many times, including both bedrooms. Dwayne's father lived very close to the townhouse, but Dwayne himself lived with his mother elsewhere in Sacramento. In the interview, Dwayne said that he spent Saturday night, March 19th, with a friend, Robert Cruz, and Cruz's friends, watching television at Robert's home, drinking, and driving around Sacramento. Dwayne abstained from drinking. Dwayne slept on Robert's couch around 4 to 6.30 Sunday. Then Robert dropped him off at his mother's house around 7, where after his mother let him in, he, sl she, uh, he slept until 2 p.m. that day. Questioned late on the night of March 21st, Robert confirmed Dwayne's alibi, and he told officers he had dropped Dwayne at, at Dwayne's mother's house around 8 a.m. on Sunday, March 20th. The following morning, Robert, troubled, told the detectives he had provided Dwayne a false alibi at Dwayne's direction. In fact, he had dropped Dwayne at his father's home near the crime scene around 4 a.m. on Sunday. Dwayne had called him later that morning and directed that if anyone were to ask, Robert should say he left Dwayne at his mother's at eight. After confessing his earlier falsehood, Robert, at the de detective's direction, made a monitored telephone call to Dwayne. So sometimes this is called as cold calling to where the person of interest doesn't know that the police are also listening in. So when Robert began, to ask Dwayne about the false alibi. Dwayne cut him off and asked him to come by later so Dwayne could show him something. Robert also contradicted Dwayne's statement that he and Dwayne did not drink any alcohol Saturday night. On Tuesday, March 22nd, the de detectives detained Dwayne who said he was on his way to see them as he was leaving his house. At the station, Dwayne was, avi was advised of and waived his Miranda rights. And as you know, Miranda, the Miranda rights are, are read and, um, and pretty much says you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you. You have a right to an attorney. If you can't afford one, one can be appointed to you. Um, kind of like if you have any questions, I ask now. But that's kind of standard to say or something along, along those lines, not that exact verbatim. So now... Dwayne admitted that Robert had, in fact, dropped him at his father's home between 3 and 4 a.m. He also admitted he had been drinking that night with Robert and his friends, but claimed he was not drunk and was in control of himself. When Dwayne realized his father was not home, he walked to a nearby Circle K convenience store and telephoned his mother's house for a ride, a ride home. Dwayne also admitted that before Robert dropped him off, he noticed his father's van was not in the driveway. No one answered at his mother's house. Dwayne also called a friend who lived in the neighborhood, Lorenzo, but got no answer there either. Dwayne initially said he thought about calling Deborah, but knew she would be in bed. Later, he said he called Deborah's and Diane's home, but no one answered. While at the Circle K, Dwayne heard a scream and the sound of glass breaking. Afraid that he would be associated with a possible crime because of his proximity, he later told Robert to say he had dropped him off at his mother's house rather than his father's. Eventually, as the detectives purported to begin filling out an arrest report and booking him, Dwayne admitted he had drunk enough beer and tequila to get drunk that from his father's he went over to Deborah's house and that he remembers uh, her screaming in the carport. Dwayne further said he thinks both women answered the front door. He told them he was stranded and may, and may have used their telephone, and that although he did not know what happened next, he remembered being in the house, he remembered being in the carport, and he remembered Deborah screaming. Asking how he stopped her from screaming, Dwayne said he did not know. 
So his case on an automatic appeal went to the Supreme Court of California. And on May 31st, 1990, the judgment of guilt was reversed and granted a retrial due to jury misconduct. So with the reversal of guilt, he gets a, an entirely brand new jury. And this jury will go through the guilt phase. And then if they found him guilty of murder and a special circumstance, then it will go to the penalty phase. And that's what happened. So we got this new trial. The new trial found, them, found him guilty. And they sentenced him to death. So on that new trial, his case got automatically appealed to the Supreme Court of California. And on June 17, 2004, the judgment was affirmed in its entirety. So what he can now do is he can um, petition for a writ of cert and file it to the United States Supreme Court. And pretty much what this asks is for the lower courts to produce all of their court records and their decisions, have the United States Supreme Court look over it and see if they want to hear his case. So on December 22nd, 2004, Twain petitioned for a writ of cert. However, the United States Supreme Court denied it on February 22nd, 2005. And this pretty much affirms what the Supreme Court of California said in affirming the judgment of death. But since he has exhausted all of his appeals, Duane does have the option of filing a writ of habeas corpus. But with the writ of habeas corpus, what he has to do is produce new evidence. And so if you look at some of the news reports, he was claiming that, nope, no. So what sometimes, if you want new evidence, what you can claim is like erotic sex and that that was something that she liked, but that's kind of hard to prove. So usually that's kind of denied. And oftentimes a writ of habeas corpus can be denied unless he proves that there was new jury misconduct like there was in his first case. So where is Dwayne Holloway now? He is still at San Quentin State Prison and he's been there since July 1st, 1985. And that means it'll be 35 years on July 11th. So that is where he is now and that's where he is at. So thank you for listening in. We post on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Saturdays. You can catch us on our next posting. Give us a follow, a like, a subscribe, give a comment, whatever floats your boat. But thank you for listening in.